turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. While I'm going to be preaching on verses 9 through 11, I would like to read the entire section from verse 4 through verse 13. Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 through 13. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do, for his good pleasure. The Lord, our God, uh, minister to our hearts. Thank you for this uh, enduring, true, uh, everlasting word. Every, every promise is true. Every word of comfort is for your children. And so we have hope and great joy. Deepen our affection for Christ, who first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank the uh, children and the parents and the team of volunteers who put on the pageant last Sunday night. It was great. You were so well prepared, and I was so proud to be the pastor of this church, and I do believe that God was glorified as the scriptures depicting his birth were set before our ears and our eyes. It is a story that never grows old. Good job. We're looking at this great Christmas text from Philippians chapter 2. How many people are really hungering? How many people are really deeply in need of somebody, somewhere, who, who can really understand what's going on in their heart and life? They don't know what it is, but there is this sense that, that there's got to be something more, and there's, got to, and there's got to be somebody in charge. I mean, why are we occupying the space we occupy on planet Earth when everything seems so screwed up? And we wonder, is everything just totally out of control? And if so, what's the use? Where's it all leading to? Do you ever stop and say, there's got to be more? And to you who are God's children say, yeah, there is, and I'm glad that, that Jesus is in control. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Last week we talked about the attitude of Jesus Christ in coming to earth. Today we're going to talk about the attitude of God the Father and how he re responded to his son. Next week we're going to talk about the attitude of the Christian in light of all this, this reality. We, we heard last week that, that Jesus did not begin his existence in the stable at Bethlehem. He existed as the eternal second person of the Trinity in eternity past. He was God receiving the worship of angels in heaven's glo glory. He did not keep that position. He did not hold on to it. It was not something that he would grasp. He didn't keep that position but, uh, of, of glory, but, but let go of it and came to earth on a great rescue mission to take on human likeness and die in our place on the cross. He came down to, to fix our, our, our dreadfully desperate human condition. We call this the humiliation of Christ. He goes down in order to 
go up. So the steps down for Jesus were to leave heaven, take on human flesh, die on the cross, and be buried. John Donne, the great English poet, said, "'Twas much that man was made like God before, but that God should be made like man, much more." And here's the theme. The baby in the manger is the one whom the Father has exalted to the highest place as Lord over this world so we can be confident in his ability and his desire to care for us. We need both desire and ability. We can want something to happen desperately but not be able to do anything about it. We can have all power but if we do not have the love or the desire, that power means nothing. But he has both the desire and the power to help us in our time of need. And you know, if I had it to do all over again in my ministry, I would emphasize Ascension Day, which has been celebrated, uh, which is celebrated by the church 40 days after Easter. Our text certainly supports uh, Christmas, the Incarnation, and, and even Easter, for he arose from the dead and has ascended into heaven. And the problem with Easter and Christmas, I don't have a problem with it, but the, the world seems to, to have hijacked it from us, and, and they bring in all kinds of other, of other junk that, that, that affects our, our celebration. But What's the world going to do with Ascension Day? I mean, you know, really, there's nothing they can do about it. it it's uh, pure and simply the ascension of Jesus Christ to his rightful place as Lord in the universe. In verses 9 through 11, we see, and by the way, Ascension Day next year comes on Cinco de Mayo. So there you go. There is something else to celebrate. We see in verses 9 through 11 the attitude of God the Father concerning the obedience of Jesus. The word therefore in verse 9 tells us what God did as a result of Jesus' obedience. Now listen, Jesus comes down, doesn't he, in verses 5 through 8. He lets go. He comes. Jesus goes up in verses 9 through 11. He comes down in verses 5 through 8. He goes up in verses 9 through 11. And as if his coming down was the action that Jesus took for us, he, he initiated it. It was, his, it was his action. The going up is ascribed to God as something that he did. He was dead. He, he couldn't do it. The Father stepped in and gave to Jesus life and ascension. God the Father raised him to life and lifted him back to heaven. We would not exalt him, would we? Jesus did not exalt himself and neither would we. We would not exalt him. We contributed to his humiliation. We did everything we could to put him to death. We said, bring on the cross, Bring on the crown of thorns. Bring on the hammer and the nails. We would not lift him up, but the Father has. The Father has said, bring on the royal robe. Put on him the crown of glory. Give him back the place that he gave up. And as Jesus said farewell to his disciples on the Mount of Olives, he was taken up from their sight. God gave him back the glory. Ephesians tells us that the power of God raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but the one to come. And he put all things under his feet. And now he is seated at the right hand of God the Father with one thing very different from the way he existed before. Whereas he was a spiritual being in eternity past, he takes on a body. And when he ascends into heaven, he does not let go of that body. Even as he did not let go of the glory when he came down. He has ascended and is the Lord Jesus in his resurrected body. Which is, of course, a great comfort and hope for us that we will have with us body and soul together. He's now in heaven as the eternal God-man, and he has given a name 
that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every con tongue confess that great name. Well, what is that name that is above every name? We sang a few of those names in O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, Root of Jesse, the day spring from on high. Did you know that there are over 200 names given for Jesus in Scripture? Is that name that's above every name the name of Jesus? Well, there's a lot of people in this world named Jesus. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Is his name Savior? Is his name Lord? I think that's it. That every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. The word Lord is the word kurios. The great name of God in the Hebrew Old Testament uh, that's used of the sovereign, one-of-a-kind, only true God is Jehovah, Yahweh. Do you know what name the Greek translation uses for Jehovah? It's the word kurios. It's used in place of Jehovah 3,000 times. Jesus is Lord. Do you believe that? Let me tell you what the significance of this exaltation is. Now, I've gone a little out of style here. I've got more than three points. I've got eight. The first five I'm going to go very quickly. But I want you to kind of see that the, the full-orbed uh, view of, of the exaltation of Jesus Christ, every one of them is a preaching point. Uh, but I'm just going to touch on them briefly. Number one, the exaltation of Jesus as Lord is another proof of his deity. So the elevation of Jesus as Lord identifies him with Jehovah. He is Lord, kurios. He is one with Jehovah. He's the one who is described in Isaiah. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. His place in glory is by the right hand of his Father. Secondly, see how fast we're going? The exaltation of Jesus is a fulfillment of prophecy. This was not an afterthought. It was something planned way before. The phrase, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, is pulled right out of the book of Isaiah. There God is speaking through Isaiah. He's describing himself as the creator, the savior of Israel. Unlike the idols of the nations that cannot do anything, they cannot speak, they cannot hear, they cannot move, they cannot save. This savior that's presented to us through Isaiah is the Lord, the savior of the ends of the earth. And if you look at Isaiah 45, verses 22 and 23, we read this. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me every knee shall bow, Every tongue shall swear allegiance. The bending of the knee to God our Savior is now the bending of the knee to Jesus Christ prophesied in the book of Isaiah. In the great passage of Isaiah 53, speaking of the sin bearer who bore our grief and carried our sorrows and upon whom all of the iniquities uh, of us were laid, the passage opens with these words in Isaiah 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. And then what follows, of course, is the great passage on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. After the crucifixion and death of our sin bearer, is the promise, the prophecy, that he will be lifted up. Number three, the exaltation of Jesus as Lord is an answer to Jesus' own prayers. Jesus prayed it. In John 17, 
verses 1, 4, and 5, and we had it read in your hearing in our worship service. Jesus is praying. The disciples are hearing him pray the night before he, he died. He's in the upper room. He's praying to his father. The disciples hear him, and he says, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. He says, I want to go back, Father. I've glorified you here on earth by doing what you've called me to do. And through the pain and the suffering that I am about to endure, I see something else. I see the exaltation. I want to be back with you, Father. No matter what happens, it's going to end well. <laughs> In Psalm 2, verse 8, God is speaking to David's greater son, the Messiah, and God says to him, Ask of me, ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. The father who loves the son for a time turned his back on his son as he died for us, and now the father will vindicate the son. He has heard his cry. When he fulfilled the purpose laid out for him by the father, he said yes to the son's prayer. It's a fulfillment of prophecy. It's an answer to Jesus' prayer. And number four, the exaltation of Jesus establishes him in his place of rule as king. And that's the great reality of the exaltation of Jesus. He is the sovereign Lord. He is working out all things according to his will. To say that Jesus is on the throne is to acknowledge his right to determine the outcome of events in this world. And with that determination, his church is at the center of his heart. Ephesians 1 tells us that he is head over all things for the church, which is his body. He exercises his rule in a way that to us seems strange. Has he forgotten us? What is he doing anyway? Does he care? Why would he allow terrorists to strike and kill people? Why, why would he allow ISIS to run amok? The fact is that his ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts, but we trust him, won't we? We will trust him for this transition as we go through some changes in the next year. Listen, my dear friends, he's the Lord. He's on the throne. He has everything covered. Nothing escapes him. Nothing ever puts a knot in his stomach or sweat on his brow. He's got it covered. Number five, the exaltation of Christ establishes him as the great high priest who listens to his people. What's he doing for us? Why is he, he there? He's hearing every cry of our heart, every need of our soul. He is taking it. He's the great intercessor, the great high priest. He hears our prayers and he lays them before the Father. And he says, Father, these are the needs of those I love. These are the needs of my people. Hear them. Respond to them. Come to their aid. We can bring him every need in prayer. And we know he will hear us. And there we go. We're done five out of eight. How about that? Number six. The exaltation of Jesus gives us the assurance that all our suffering will one day come to an end. And this is, this is one of the richest and most precious of all reasons why the exaltation of Jesus Christ is such an encouragement to his people. Why is it that there is so much suffering around us and in our own lives? Do we believe that he's working for the sake of this world and bringing the lost to him? And more importantly, do we believe that he is moving for his church and for his people? He, he sees the forest, but does he see each individual tree? Yes, he does. Will we trust him in every event of life? Jesus was still on the throne the last time I looked. 
There's a purpose for the trials we face. Paul tells Timothy, if we suffer with him, we will also reign with him. And there is no reigning with him unless and without the sufferings with him. Let me give you an illustration. It's an old one, but I think it speaks to this text. In October of 1856, about 160 years ago, the great preacher, Charles Spurgeon, was only 22 years old, and he had a huge church in, in, in England. He was only 22. He had been married one year. And the church, every Sunday, grew, and it was so full that they rented the Surrey Garden Music Hall, seating 12,000 people. Someone in the audience did a very stupid thing. He yelled, fire, fire, and, and everybody panicked and started running, and, and the balcony above collapsed. Seven people were killed. Hundreds more were injured. How about that coming to church and having that happen? Spurgeon was also injured. He was found unconscious on the platform and was rushed to his home, more dead than alive. 22 years old. He was so depressed, he almost quit. He said that even the sight of the Bible for a period of time caused panic to rise within his soul. Many people thought that his ministry was over. Three weeks later, when he returned to preach, he wondered if anybody would be there, and it was packed. And he chose for his text Philippians 2, verses 9 through 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And he said in that sermon, and this is not a quote, just a summary, he said to his congregation, will you take comfort in this today? This exaltation of Christ. If this does not move you, he said, if this does not stir you at the depths of your heart, how can you say that you belong to him? When you cannot lift your eyes, when you are in the lowest place, as I have been for the last several weeks, Jesus knows. He was there in the deepest place, in the garden. He was there in the deepest place on the cross. A far deeper place than you could ever experience. And he is with you now in your deep place. And God raised him up. And if you are united to him, he will do for you what he did for Jesus. Every point of suffering and need, Jesus says, I know, I'm with you. You will be exalted. What a preacher. Thank you, Spurgeon. Number seven. The exaltation has a great purpose. One day the truth will be told. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. This is the truth that the world longs to hear. It is the truth that the world needs to hear. It is the truth that will reverberate and echo through the halls of heaven and bounce between the stars and space. Jesus is Lord. Every tongue will confess. Every knee will bow. The angels above, the dead in their graves, even the demons from hell, indeed all created beings, will one day either willingly or unwillingly confess this truth. Jesus is Lord and everyone will fall on their knees before him who is worthy of universal praise. I did not make it up. God said it and I believe it. You will do it willingly at the last judgment before you enter glory, or you will do it unwillingly before being cast into a godless eternity. One preacher put it this way, the cacophony of unbelief will be silenced. No more of this equivocating, shushing, doubting, cursing, denying, 
or defying. No more will a high school football coach be, be suspended because after the game he kneeled, knelt down on the 50-yard line to pray and he started to be joined by his teammates and after a while he was joined by the players on the other team and the school board where he works said, we can't have that. No more will the ACLU come along and try and take down a crash in some town center. They're not going to win. Jesus wins. For 2,000 years, the church's most basic creed has been Jesus Christ is Lord, but it has always been a creed shouted into the world's roar, drowned out in the clamor, intimidated by the tumult, but not for long. Not for long. Hold on, people of God. Jesus is Lord, and God receives all the glory. Number eight, the exaltation of Jesus Christ assures us of his second coming. Dear children, Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back for you. You may be with me where I am. That where I am, you may be also. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither be afraid. Hear these words of comfort, dear people. He's coming for us. And when the door of heaven finally swings open for all to see, when eyes are opened, when the last battle is won and Christ has triumphed, when the church has been brought to her bridegroom and all accounts have been settled, then from every corner of creation, from 10,000 languages of men and angels, even from creation itself, which has groaned waiting for his appearing, will rise one unison declaration, Jesus Christ is Lord, and the Father will rejoice in his Son, in his children, and in himself. These last two things I have mentioned have not yet been fulfilled on this theological, chronological time chart, that every knee will bow and that Jesus, Jesus will come back and every knee will bow. But we have every certainty from the reality of God's word that it will indeed happen. He will come. And we too will be exalted with him and he will receive the worship of the universe. Do you know this? Do you believe this? Is Jesus Christ your Lord? Next week we're going to look at, at what this means for us. This lofty theology in the midst of everyday living. The mundane and regular stuff of life, how we respond, is built upon this fabric of theology that Jesus Christ is the exalted Lord. It should make a difference in what you say and in what you do. Jesus says to us, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God. To say Jesus is Lord is to touch on the greatest realities of obedience in the midst of the stuff of life. Revelation 5 says, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. That's to be our response. We say amen and we worship. We worship in the assembly. We worship with our lives. We worship with our lips. Glory be to God. Glory be to Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus, how many times have we said that? Lord Jesus. We need a Savior. 
but not a Savior who bows to us. Not, not a Savior who, who is fire insurance, but a Savior who has a demand on our lives. A Savior who is the Lord. A Savior who says, this is what I want for you. And this is what I want from you. I want your life in total and complete obedience. How we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are exalted to your rightful place. And we long to be with you when every tear will be wiped away from our eyes. Every sin that we are so prone to will be put out of our lives and there will be uninterrupted fellowship with one another and mostly, O oh Lord, with you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.